what do you call a sustainable landscape designer who works with clients all over the country in exchange for actual American dollars who herself has a completely unlandscaped yard? Embarrassed. <laughs> you call her embarrassed. Let's go. Hi, I'm Daryl. I'm a sustainable landscape designer and I help clients all over the country transform their wasted and wasteful outdoor spaces into functional, beautiful landscape. But sometimes when you do something professionally, you don't take the time to actually do the work for yourself, which means I myself have a yard unbecoming of a professional. This is the year we fix that. So this summer, I'm partnering with Garden for Wildlife to spread the word on native plants and transform my Salt Lake City yard into a sustainable landscape and a native wildlife habitat certified by the National Wildlife Federation. I'm taking you along with me every step of the way, so follow along to watch my yard transform. Thanks for watching. So my yard in the summertime is normally really, really cute. My backyard, at least, because I've got this big garden going on here. Hey, 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 look at me, okay? It's messy. It's messy. It's okay. All right, it's all gonna be okay, we're working on it, but it's really kind of scary. I'm embarrassed to be showing the public this because yards are literally my job, but you know what, we're here, we're gonna be vulnerable together. We're going on this experience together, all right? <laughs> Thanks, Lee, that's great. So I have my garden area over here. This is where I grow all of my, I grow all my vegetables, I grow all my cut flowers, things like that. We're gonna be doing a lot more native plants in this area this summer, it'll be really cute. This is my dog's area and it's pretty large still. I'm thinking of shrinking it down a little bit more, just sort of shrinking this into one central open shape for my dog to use and putting a bunch of perennial flower borders around it. My husband has said the word barrel sauna as far as features of the back yard that we wanna use. We might deck some of this. We'll see what this year brings. I'm really interested in swapping out some of this lawn for like a lower maintenance, more eco-friendly lawn alternative. Maybe some fine fescue, some clover, and some native wildflowers would be really cool. Basically, I don't wanna mow the lawn ever again. That's the thesis of this whole experiment. Okay, what you're about to see, what you're about to see, it's not for the faint of heart, okay? So if you get scared, just keep your eyes on me. Just keep your eyes on me. What I'm about to take you through is a completely unused side yard that has just languished for the years that I've been in this house. And then turns out when you start like a successful landscaping business, you don't have time to work on your own yard. And it's kind of just like hairstylists who never cut their hair or accountants who never do their taxes. This side yard eventually, God willing, is going to be a 100% completely native food forest. So we're gonna have all amazing Utah native things and layer in a bunch of really great perennial edibles as well. This is on the north side of the house but it actually gets quite a bit of Eastern and Western sun. So morning and evening sun. So from about April to October, six to seven hours of sunlight a day, more than enough to support the like edible food forest of my dreams. I basically want it to grow up really lush and tall and kind of just, and I want you to walk through it and feel like you're entering another dimension when you come out of this amazing fairy tunnel into my gorgeous, beautiful garden in the backyard. That's my goal. We'll see if we get there like this year or next, we'll see. So my front yard has basically no landscaping except for the landscaping that came with the house when they flipped it, which I think was two owners ago. Basically some really tall overgrown shrubs, some poor, poor, poor irises that I really need to divide, okay? This can't be good for business. Like I can't be showing people this. Okay, the maple tree, she's my pride and joy. We love her. We love the maple tree. The grass, because what do we not do? What do we not do in this house? We do not spray Roundup. So the grass is pretty biodiverse. We've got dandelion and other weeds and stuff coming in. I'm good with that for now, but we're definitely gonna be swapping this out for like a much prettier native landscape in the very near future. So we've got a completely wasted, just weedy park strip right now, just grass, couple of trees. I'm gonna go ahead and put in just a full lush native perennial flower border, just fill this entire thing up with amazing gorgeous native perennials. I should say that all of this turf will qualify for the Utah Turf Buyback Program. So I'm gonna be submitting in to get the rebate, which is one to $3 per square feet to swap all of this grass to native landscape. So if you live in Utah and you're interested in that, give it a Google, cause it's worth getting the rebate before you do any work. You wanna make sure that you apply for it before you start. This whole side yard is a bit of a saga because I originally wanted to sheet mulch it, cover it in wood chips and put in some raised beds and turn it into a garden. Since doing that, a couple major factors have changed. One, my neighbors who shall remain nameless wanted nothing to do with my mess. And so they put in this three foot fence, completely solid, allowing for no Southern light penetration in order to fully delineate their yard from my yard, thus making the whole like 
cute native perennial border of full sun plants a little more difficult. So that was one factor that sort of changed the course of action. The second one was that we obtained two more vehicles for work. <laughs> a trailer that we used to carry all of our plants and then a different kind of trailer that we used to travel all over the country in order to visit our design project. So we now have a significantly greater need for more places to park, more places to put trailers and utility vehicles and whatnot. And so I basically have given myself permission to change my mind. So we're gonna go ahead and expand our driveway and put a great place to park, but we're definitely putting in a beautiful tree at the front and a beautiful tree at the back to create some shade and make it beautiful. The plus side is that if like you actually look at all this wood chip stuff, there's a lot of mycelial activity happening. So we're gonna go ahead and transport all of these wood chips that we're not gonna end up needing here over to that food forest area before we plant. So now that we've gotten through the absolute horror of showing you what we're starting with, these are the major goals I have for my yard this year. One, we're reducing the size of the grass and incorporating more planting areas with lots of native plants. Two, we wanna create privacy, we wanna create shade, and we want more noise barrier. I'm not sure if you can hear all of the sound that's happening, but I live in a very urban area and it'd be great to stop. It would be great to soften some of this traffic noise with lush shrubbery, dense plantings, whatever. Three, I want to invite a lot more beneficial insects and pollinators into my actual garden space. Yes, climbing roses are beautiful. Yes, vegetables are amazing and produce amazing yields. But at the end of the day, truly native wildlife wants native plants. So we're going to be really leveraging the borders of the garden as well as interplanting my vegetables and flowers this year with native perennial plantings that will welcome back those beneficial insects again and again. And the culmination of all of these things is that I want my yard to become a certified wildlife habitat through the National Wildlife Federation. And what that means is that all of the major components to support support truly endangered and beneficial native wildlife are in place. And there's a lot of different things that go into it to make that happen. So Lee, do you wanna come inside, have a cup of coffee and I can walk you through? Yeah, all right, I'm gonna walk Lee and the rest of you through what we need to do in order to make our yard a certified wildlife habitat. So let's go make some coffee. So in order to become a certified wildlife habitat, there are five major categories you need to make sure are featured in your yard. Food sources, water sources, cover, places to raise young, and sustainable gardening practices. Number one, food sources for wildlife. This can be berries, seeds, nuts, nectar from native plants. It can even be foliage and twigs. It can be a hummingbird feeder, a regular bird feeder. The most important thing in order to get your yard certified is that you have three of those. So maybe do a hummingbird feeder, make sure you have lots of native plants and at least one of the shrubs that you plant is berry producing and you'll be golden. My yard already has a hummingbird feeder, a bird feeder, some native plants, some berry producing plants. So technically my yard already meets these requirements, but when I'm adding in that all native food forest and significantly more amazing native plants throughout, it's really going to bump up the amount of wildlife that my yard can support in general. Now, Sourcing native plants, not always that straightforward, which is why I'm so excited to be working with Garden for Wildlife on this video to spread awareness about native plants because they actually provide really straightforward ways to get your hands on native plants if you live on the East Coast or the Midwest. It's an e-commerce option where you can actually order native plants and collections of native plants right to your door. What's cool about this is you can enter your zip code and get things that are native truly to you, not just your general state or area. And you can also filter by light conditions and soil conditions and soil moisture to make sure that the stuff you're planting actually wants to grow where you live. And what's even cooler than that is they have these collections of plants. So like the monarch collection that supports butterflies and the firefly collection that supports fireflies and a rain garden collection if you have really wet soil, things like that. So it makes shopping really easy and kind of helps you get over that decision paralysis that comes down to choosing like, what should I put in my yard to make it look good? They've already done that for you. It's already picked out and it's gonna look fabulous. Midwest, East Coast, if you live over there and you're looking for native options, give it a click, give it a look. Really, really cool stuff. Number two, your yard needs a water source. This can be a naturally occurring water source like a lake or a stream. If you have one of those in your yard already, I mean, good for you. But if you don't, something like a bird bath or a water feature or even a pond that you put in yourself, something like that, that'll be perfect. Now my yard actually technically meets this requirement already because I already 
already have a bird bath in my yard. And I've actually adapted the bird bath to be a pollinator bath by putting in little pebbles that can be landing pads for bees and, and other things that need to drink and, you know, don't want to drown. This does not need to be overly complicated. You can even DIY a bird bath of some kind. Keep it simple, but make sure that pollinators and birds and wildlife in general have access to water, especially in the heat of the summer. Number three, cover. Because wildlife, just like us, they need a place to retreat to, to like get their bearings, have a little nap, emerge back out into society, rested and rejuvenated. So we need to provide spaces for them to like hunker down and hide. These can be naturally occurring things. They can also be things that you fashion together. For naturally occurring cover, wooded areas, dense shrubs, thick ground cover, meadows and prairies, you get the idea. If you live in an urban environment like me, you can actually fashion together places for wildlife to take cover. This could be a rock wall, a log pile, a roosting box, a bat box. There are plenty of options that you can either purchase or DIY. In order for your yard to be a certified wildlife habitat, your yard needs to have at least two of those options for cover. Opportunities for cover that I'm going to be adding into my yard include a bat box, which also has a ton of additional benefits for integrated pest management and whatnot, as well as more dense shrubs, trees, foliage in general, lots of grasses, lots of places for pollinators and whatnot to hunker down and hibernate. Number four, your certified wildlife habitat needs places to raise young. This can be mature trees, dense shrubs, nesting boxes that you put in specifically. It can also be a pond for our amphibian friends. Also on the list of things that count as a place to raise young, uh, they do say cave. So if you happen to have a cave in your backyard, you're set. You're golden. And another option that the NWF provides are host plants for caterpillars. So if you want to plant a native milkweed variety, which is the only host plant for the monarch butterfly caterpillar, you've already checked one of these off the list and you're also doing a great service to this endangered butterfly. You need two of these in order to be certified as a wildlife habitat. So if you already have some mature trees on your property, maybe plant some milkweed or build a nesting box. I don't know, go outside and dig a pond one day. Do whatever your heart tells you to do. So my yard already has three mature trees trees and I know already for a fact that a sycamore in the back corner is home to a multi-generational family of doves who I am very close with and well connected with but in general I also want to plant a lot more milkweed plants to support monarch butterflies in my area and I'd like to put in a small pond as well in my wild wildest dreams. And lastly sustainable practices. You need to implement practices in at least two out of the three categories that the NWF lists on their website in order to make sure that you're maintaining your habitat in a sustainable and eco-friendly way. So category number one is soil and water conservation. And you can implement practices in this category by building a rain garden, xeriscaping, converting to drip irrigation, using mulch, stabilizing your hillsides by planting a ground cover that prevents erosion, generally just promoting the health and stability of your soil and conserving water along the way. In my yard specifically, we're reducing water use by converting to drip irrigation and also using drought tolerant native plants that need less water. We're mulching heavily around those plants and we're also collecting rainwater off of the roof and directing it right into the landscape. Number two, controlling exotic species. You can do any number of things, including using integrated pest management, introducing more native plants, removing invasive plants. And number three, implementing organic practices, which you can do just by eliminating chemical pesticides, chemical fertilizers, maybe even composting. In my yard, we already do all three of those things because we don't like spraying chemicals on our yard and we love composting as a way to reduce waste and create closed loop systems on our property. So I guess what I'm saying is, yeah, it doesn't look that great out there yet, but like it's still working. <laughs> So listen, it's spring, summer's right around the corner. The time to get your hands in the dirt and make some of this happen, it's right now. So if you want resources, tips, ideas on where to get started, you can check out the National Wildlife Federation website. You can check out Garden for Wildlife. They are partnering with me on this video. I'm very happy to be working with them. You can also check out my own website, which is yardfarmer.co. And I have a bunch more resources linked in the description of this video. So go give that a look-see. You're gonna find what you need to get started. So in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna be designing my entire yard, planting a bunch of native plants, building a food forest, hanging a bat box, putting in a water feature. Like there's a lot going on to make this a certified habitat. And I hope that you will follow along with me on this journey and be with me when I hang the sign, the sign that says National Wildlife Federation Certified Wildlife Habitat Front Yard, Front and Center. It's gonna be a big moment for me. And I hope we go on this journey together. I'm very excited. Stay tuned for more. <laughs>